Hello everyone, today is Thursday, April 6th. Wow, it's April already, that's amazing. April 6, 2017, this is the Weekend Charts. As usual, I want to thank everybody for showing up. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. So what are we talk about? Well, obviously, I've been calling it a bull leg, and as I often say, I really hate to identify anything, because that's when you get into trouble, or identify, I should say, label anything. You kind of paint yourself in a corner. But um, so far, I think the uptrend's intact. Uh, we've had a little cheek in the market's armor. As of late, financials have begun to crumble a little bit, and uh, a couple other areas losing some momentum. The overall market's losing momentum. So we're going to talk about that, and we'll flesh it out quite a bit. Obviously, your questions on trading and your favorite stock picks. Two rules for those of you, or suggestions, I should say, for those of you who are new to the show. Uh, number one, wait until we get to the live charts before you begin asking about stocks. And that's just so that um, your stock picks don't get lost in the questions. And also, for your benefit, ask about one stock at a time and then hit enter. And that way I could uh, cover it and then hit delete and keep going. So what do we talk about in addition to that, the normal stuff? Well, I'm going to follow up just really briefly on IPOs. We've kind of beat the dead horse on those over the past several weeks, several months. But I do want to talk a little bit about that. Um, I want to continue to follow up on the methodology until, boy, you hate to say that. You hate to say until, but yeah, that's the reality of trading. Eventually, all trades end badly. But until... All the trades from a recent portfolio stop out. We'll see how that turns out. And I think that's going to be kind of fun. I mean, so far it's been kind of fun. It's got me a little nervous here and there. So this week's focus is why trading is hard. And then you'll see in a minute why I put trend in there. There's a disclaimer. Uh, I can sum it up really quickly. All predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Now, I've been talking a lot about IPOs lately, and the great thing about IPOs is, as a general statement, there's a little bit more to it than that, but as a general statement than this, I should say, but as a general statement, buy them if they go up. If they don't go up, just don't buy them. So, in other words, don't get caught up in the euphoria or the excitement or the story or lack thereof. Just buy the ones that go up and avoid the ones that go down. Kind of like in a Will Rogers kind of way. If stocks don't go up, buy stocks that go up. They don't go up, don't buy them. So again, here's a snap crap. And so far, it's been snap crap. So again, if they don't go up, don't buy them. And then if you go back a few weeks in uh, both my column and the week of charts, I talked about the... Uh, a simple system for IPOs and that would be buy them when they're making new highs and when they're also uh, above their my pen's not working here one second so buy them when they close at a new high with a few caveats in addition to when they are low is above their five-day moving average and the reason I said that was because the five-day moving average it is, is because it'll stop you from buying the stock on the first five days. And the, the earliest we'll ever buy an IPO is day five, if you have the IPO course. And I just thought it'd be kind of fun to put in a five-day moving average so you wouldn't buy an IPO too soon. And then I thought it'd also be kind of fun to say, okay, well, let's just buy them when the low is greater than the moving average, in other words, there's daylight, and the close is the highest close. And then the caveat I mentioned earlier was, provided, of course, the high of trading is not set on the first day. So for this stock to trigger that particular pattern, it would have to be up here towards 28 or something. Now, the way things are looking with this stock so far, I wouldn't touch this with a 10-foot pole until, unless, it began to hit some new highs. Now, maybe six months from now, if this thing bottoms out for a long, long time and makes a bow tie, I might change my mind. But for now, I see no reason to go after it. So very simple rules when it comes to IPOs can keep you out of a lot of trouble. There's a lot more to trading them than just that. But you're certainly 
well on your way if you follow these things. Now, if you've been watching the last few weeks, I've been talking about following a methodology, the hardest, easiest thing you ever do. And the reason I said hardest, easiest, because it's hard not to do anything, especially when positions begin to erode a little bit. But usually, not all the time, but longer term at least, the way to trade is to follow your plan. So we had this portfolio that was looking a little dubious in here. And you can see it was down to uh, on the cusp of going negative. And my point was back in February, back on February 7th, it was, hey, you know what? It ain't over until the fat lady sings. So I thought it'd be kind of fun to follow up with this portfolio, good, bad, and different, over the next few weeks. So if we go back to 2000, I'm sorry, to February 7th, 2017, we had that $500 round numbers loss. And then if we take those same positions and the NTB uh, is no longer open, okay? And with a little discretion, maybe it could be. And then the S&D is no longer open. That turned into a losing trade. But the other ones still are. So if you mark to market everything, adding in that loser and that winner, and not adding any trade subsequently to 2000, why do I keep saying 2000? To February 7th, 2017, you can see that as of last night, the mark to market is a little bit of a $4,000. So we went from a $500 gain to a 40 something $100, $4,200 gain. Okay? Not setting the world on fire, but you can see it's much better than just a small gain. And my hope, and I know I just said the word hope, but my hope for illustrative purposes is that a year from now we're still having this conversation and this number is going to be tremendously bigger than this. It's about eight times bigger now, but hopefully it'll be a hundred times bigger and it'll make a good case for following the plan. Now, sometimes you lose money by following the plan. And that's the hard part, and that's where the psychology rears its ugly head. But for now, let's just say bye, Felicia, and we're going to keep following along with this um, example. Now, I went to bed thinking why trading is so hard. This is based on some interactions I've had over the past few weeks, and then Longer term, it goes back to interactions I've had. Um, I said that word. I, that almost that almost came out kind of uh, Freudian slippage, didn't it? <laughs> well, there goes my PG-13 rating. Oh, well. Um, but it goes back to interactions that I've had over many, many, many years. And I think when, when I wrote Layman's, I went back and I found that I had about 30,000 emails that I'd replied to. And it made me think about why trading is hard. And trading is hard. And then I also really thought about why trend trading is hard. Because trend trading is hard. In fact, as I'm going to touch upon right now, it's probably the hardest form of trading. And then I got to thinking this morning, it's like, well, this is a pretty lofty goal. And, and my original goal was to really get into the psychology of all this. And I think I'm just going to be able to touch upon that today. So I don't know if I'll resume this next week or the week after, but I think this could be part one of many, many parts. But let me see if I can give you a little thumbnail. Now, before we do that, let's touch upon something that seems much easier okay and here's the thing when it comes to markets if you want a comfort if you want comfort you should go buy a comfort is what I say so-called income producing strategies will work quite often until they don't I've got I got an email this morning from someone uh, make two to four percent every day it's like no no I mean you know, I don't want to be a, a jerk, but if I could make 2 to 4% every day, can you imagine the compounding on that? Anybody have time to, can somebody punch that, anybody have a financial calculator, punch in, just punch in 2% a day. 
Good Lord. With compounding, you would own the world pretty quick. Well, unfortunately, it's not that easy. Now, these so-called income-producing strategies, they actually can work quite well until they don't. And by income-producing, you're going to have to do something like mean reversion. You're going to have to do something like selling options. Or you're going to have to do a very, very short-term trading type of methodology where you're kind of scalping. Unfortunately, even if you're trading the very, very short term, something bad could still happen. A stock could get halted. Um, some bad news can come out. My Cajun just slipped out. So the point about that is you have to really know your methodology. And I know I pick on the reversions of the mean people quite a bit. But thank you, Phil. But the reality is it's such it's it's so blatant and it's so easy to identify the problem with it. And on top of that, I get more former reversion to the mean type traders than any other methodologies combined. They go do the reversion to the mean thing, and then they come back to me and say, hey, Dave, I get it. And some of them have really studied extensively. I can't throw any, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but I'll say that some of them, let's just say, were very up close and personal with a lot of this reversion to the mean stuff. Okay. Now, Phil says, that if you compounded 2% a day, I'm not sure what he's compounding, but he said that would come to 5,240% a year. If I could make, five, let's just say 5,000%. If I could make 5,000% a year, I think I would very quietly make 5,000% a year and just sit on my boat and do whatever, uh, as opposed to grinding it out day after day after day. Okay, so that's Phil's numbers based on 2%. Yeah, Donald, I think you might be a little off on that because it's compounded. So every day you compound that in. So that would mean if I was trading 100 k I'd make $2,000 today, and tomorrow I'd make 102000 No, I'd make 2% uh, times 102000 so again, you really need to know your methodology. I know I pick on the reversions to the mean people, but it's so blatant in that you're you're eating like a bird and defecating like an elephant, the old commodity adage. So I do want to pick apart my own methodology. So let's talk about my approach to markets, which is trend following. Before we do that, Let's talk about trends. Um, Michael Covell is my Facebook friend, but I doubt very seriously that he would pick me up from the airport. <laughs> when, my, uh, when my youngest, or oldest, I guess now, oldest daughter, when my oldest daughter first got into Facebook, <laughs> she had all these friends, and then we had to, like, we kind of want to monitor what was going on, like, who's this, who's that, and... Uh, you know, you find out really quickly, she really didn't know these people that well. And she was younger now. I mean, obviously, when you get a little older, you don't worry so much about these things. You have to let them make their own decisions. But anyway, my whole thinking was, you know, who who in this list would not pick you up from the airport? <laughs> you know? And that's a, that's a, quote, real friend. But Michael Covell and I are Facebook friends. And it's funny. Obviously, he doesn't know who I am because uh, he... He commented about something on his book, and I said, "Hey," because he showed the index, and I said, "Hey, you have any uh, you have any trend following morons in that?" And he, I think he got a little offended. I think he thought I was calling him a trend following moron or something. And anyway, if you go to my website, the, there's an article on the homepage that explains that that I submitted to uh, Proactive Trader. Anyway, I, I like what what Michael Covell wrote. Michael Covell has written extensively about trend following. There is something that everyone who succeeds in markets follows, knowingly or unknowingly. And this is my whole basis for trading trends. So I said, hey, Michael Well said, here's my corollary. All successful trades must 
capture a trend. So if you're, if you're, let's say you're you're selling an option, well, that option has to decay. That decay would be a trend. Okay. So if you're trading reversion to the mean, well, that that a new trend better emerge soon. So this is why I'm a trend follower. So again, the only way to profit from a trade, from any trade, is a capture or a trend. I know it's a little captain obvious, but this whole filming and putting together this uh, beginner's course has really got me thinking that people sometimes lose sight of these things, such as the only way to make a profit on a trade is capture a trend. So without going into too much detail, because I know you guys know this, but you have to sell higher than you buy. So if you buy at point A and sell at point B, and it's a profitable trade, then obviously from A to B is a trend. So that's why I'm a trend trader. Now, when it comes to trend trading, you need to know the nuances. And this is my own feelings going through my own ups and downs, trials and tribulations, and tens of thousands of people that I've conversed with over the years. One thing that is hard for many and difficult is that outliers are key. Now, it's sometimes you'll have a, 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 a nice winning streak. And there's that word streak again. Well, I'm going to actually address that, quite frankly, in a second. But sometimes you'll have a really nice winning streak where you'll be like nearly 100% profitable on every trade, okay? And I'll show you one of those in one second. But that's not really the ultimate goal to make a bunch of small winning trades. It feels good. It's kind of uh, nice. Push your button, get a peanut. But that's not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is to catch the occasional home run. And it could be a little elusive. And as, I'll, as you'll see in just a few minutes, a lot of times in the meantime, you sort of have to grind it out until that happens. Now, by outlier, I mean the nice big winning trade, which is important for your performance time and time again. People email me and say, Dave, I just, uh, I don't get this service. I can't make a dime. And I'm like, well, let's let's take a look at things. Did you get this big winner? No, but I took those three stinkers that you recommended. Well, okay. Those three stinkers will obviously create a losing portfolio, but the one big winner can make all the difference in the world. Now, along the lines of outliers, I think that's what Mr. Sakota was talking about in the Whipsaw song. I have saw Ed up close and personal sing the Whipsaw song, as I think I mentioned before. He brought his banjo to uh, one of the, he was our guest speaker at the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts meeting. And he started off his little show by singing the Whipsaw song. You get a whip and I get a saw, one good trend pays for them all. Well, if you put take trend and synonymous with the word trade, and or you could use the word outlier, and that's what he's talking about. So just as a current example, for instance, if you take a look at the open portfolio as of last night, I think it looks a little bit better today, which is praise the Lord, as uh, Medea would say. Hallelujah. Uh, where's my pen? Oh, there it is. It's hard to find today. Oh, I know what happened. I sped up my mouse. and I sped up my mouse to increase productivity. No, I can't find it. Anyway, uh, 2428 open portfolio. Now, if you look a little harder, you'll see that just this one open trade here. Remember, this is this is a closed swing trade. This is a closed swing trade. I keep the swing trade portion in the open portfolio just so you can see the entire trade being tracked. So let's say this uh, this trade would have scratch out. At least you can see that even though it scratched out, it would be a, a winning trade overall. 
But the point is, before I digress too far, is that 2428 open profits, okay, $2,581 of those open profits is just this one trade. So you take out this one trade, and this number goes negative, okay? And you take out also, I guess you take out the, the swing trade portion too. So now you subtract $3,500, round numbers, or $3,600 from this, and obviously you're at not an incredible loss, but you're at a loss, and mentally you're in a totally different position. Now again, I'm just going to kind of touch upon some of these psychological aspects, but that's a really tough one. Missing that outlier is going to put you in a state of regret, and it's going to bum you out in following the methodology. You're less likely to believe in the methodology if you're missing the outlier. Greg Morris used to use the word sharpshoot, sharpshoot signals. And that's the problem. You start sharpshooting signals, picking and choosing, as Murphy would have it, you're going to end up picking the losers and avoiding the winners. Now, one thing that you'll see quite a bit is you'll spend a lot of time grinding it out, and you're often treading water at best. And I've been thinking about this quite a bit lately, and that's actually okay. You might go six, eight months, maybe even a little bit longer, where you're just grinding it out and you're barely keeping your head above the water. But guess what? You're staying in the game. And as I'll touch upon in just a minute, you never know when that next big winner or winners are going to come along. So if you are trading this, either through following me directly or grinding it out on your own, and you're like, geez, I just I can't seem to get ahead. I make a little, lose a little, make a little, lose a little, make a little, lose a little. And I just keep chipping away at it, chipping away at it. But it seems like I'm spinning my wheels. I'm just treading water. Well, that's pretty normal in between trends. And as I often write about and have written extensively and talked extensively, is that patience is key. It's very hard to be that patient, especially in today's microwave society. But you have to be very, very, very long game oriented. I have a few clients who have come in and I've told them to hang in there, hang in there, hang in there, hang in there. And they've been gracious enough to hang in there for upwards, I'd say maybe in a year. And it's I know it's hard. And then all of a sudden things start working. They're like, you know what, Dave, I get it now hung out, I see, I understand. Most people aren't that long game oriented, okay? And most people aren't that willing to be that patient. And what happens is they go off and they go grail hunting. And these same people come back to me, it usually takes about 10 years, okay? <laughs> And they say, you know what, Dave, I've done the grill hunting. I now realize you just have to stick with one viable methodology longer term. But it's hard. And psychologically, we're really not made to, to stick with something long enough to reap the fruits of, of your labor, especially something like trading, which could be quite intangible as I'll touch upon in one second there's an uncertainty there okay and the definition of insanity and this is something I had to wrap my head around very early in trading is doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over and expecting a different outcome and in trading you might do the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and just grind it out and not get anywhere. And there are times when it could be quite streaky. So you'll have losses and losses and losses and losses and maybe make a little here and there. And again, you're kind of grinding it out. 
and then all of a sudden you'll have a string of winners and you'll feel pretty good about things. Now, this isn't necessarily a period I'm, I'm bragging about because I would much rather have some of these, this all turned into a bunch of little swing trades, okay? I mean, they're better than a poke in the eye. I'm happy, but the accuracy was through the roof. There's one losing trade based on this snapshot here. So it was a very good period of time, at least percent correct wise. I would much rather have some really big winners in here, but you know, it was grinded out, grinded out, and then you had a nice string of winning trades. And then what follows a string of winning trades? Well, a string of losing trades, okay? Most people quit somewhere around here, okay? Or they start somewhere around here, then quit somewhere down here. So you have to hang tight, and this goes for any methodology, not just trend trading, but you have to take you have to hang tight long enough to reap the fruits of your labor. Now, here's something which could be a little difficult for those newer to trading my style, the short to intermediate term trend following. In other words, you're looking to capture a swing trade and then tough it out longer term through a trailing stop to ride out a longer term trend. A little discretion can help tremendously. Now, I think you can trade things mechanically if you lack the discipline for discretion. And I think you'll do okay longer term. But a little bit of discretion makes all the difference in the world. Now, keep in mind, I'm not talking about every day and not all day. As a general statement, based on my experience over the last 10, 15 years or however long I've been doing the service, but it seems like a little discretion is only needed about once every three months. I might warn once every couple of weeks, hey, this could use a little discretion. But the reality is you only need, you only need a little discretion about once every three months. And like Sakota said, one big winner pays for them all. So by that I mean, let's say you're in a stock and you could either be in longer term trend following mode or even early in the trade. But let's say that you've got a stop and it just kind of nicks that stop barely and turns right back around. And like we talked about last week, let's say the futures are weak coming into the market. Let's say your stock looked like this closed on its low and your stop was like right here. So you know coming into this day that this stock could very likely and easily hit that stop, at least on the open. So you can apply a little bit of discretion and see if it turns around. And obviously you have to have an uncle point. Now I'm not going to go through the details of this because we talked about this last week. But go and watch last week's presentation. That's on sticking with a big, sticking with a, um, with a trade, which could, it could be the key word in this sentence, but could turn into a big winner. Now, the other thing of discretion is there's a few discretion things like taking partial profits when it's very, very close and just can't seem to get there. Or if it got to that partial profit very quickly over, let's say, two to three days in a trade, you don't want to look a gift horse in the mouth. So that's another form of discretion. But the, the big... That's that's that, that's going to help keep you in the game, that little discretion there. But that's not going to help you make the big money, but it helps. But these two things will help you to make the big money or will help you avoid some serious losses. And damage control could help quite a bit. Somebody emailed me an extreme example of that where a stock gap like to right here. And this is, well, I already got the loss. Let's just see what happens. I'll have an uncle point in mind. And then the stock turned around. The next day it gapped up like right here. Now that's an extreme example. That doesn't happen often. But every now and then you can mitigate quite a bit of losses through a damage control type of situation. So a little discretion does help. But psychologically this can be tough. Because everybody wants, wants me and anyone else who has a methodology to explain it with some sort of certainty. And we'll talk about that in one second. And people say, well, this could be a little arbitrary. Well, it can be a little arbitrary, but once you get some experience 
And the discretion is not that hard. Discretion can almost be somewhat mechanical if you think about it, okay? You've got a stock, again, close to the stop, STOP. And you're like, okay, well, it's going to hit me on the open. Let me just see what happens on the open. If it turns around fairly quickly and doesn't hit my uncle point, then I'll stay with it. So that's not that arbitrary. Now, keep in mind that any viable methodology must be designed for limited losses and unlimited gains and not just the opposite. As I said a minute ago, you can't, like the old commodity adage, eat like a bird and poo like an elephant, okay? You can't take little tiny gains and then occasional huge loss, okay? You'll feel really good for quite a while and then you'll want to uh, put a gun in your head, you know, because you'll be wiped out. My wife hates when I use that metaphor. So even though I think I've solved for that problem, okay, of the limited gains, I'm sorry, limited losses, hopefully I went a Freudian slip, and unlimited gains, you still have to be super prudent. And if you think about the drawdown chart, if you F up and lose half of your money, now you got to make back a lot more than 50%. How much you have to make back? Well, you have to make back at least 100%. And that's going to be hard to do. So let's just suppose for a second that getting back to that little uh, winning streak, and there's that word streak, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But let's suppose that you stuck with this position instead of letting it, letting it stop you out. And what is this? This is one about 1.3% 1 loss on a 100K portfolio, which will come up in one second. Let's say you wrote that stock down to zero. Now, I know that stock's about $8 a share now, so it doesn't make for a great hypothetical, but let's just assume it could happen, okay? Because it can. Sooner or later, you'll buy a stock and hopefully you'll honor your stop, but it'll subsequently go to zero. I think I have a bankrupt company in my portfolio that's been there for many years. I hate it. Every time I log in, I got to look at that stupid company that got away from me, you know? So in this particular case, you can see a very manageable 1.3% loss turned into a 6.6% 6 .6 loss, okay? So you really don't have to make back much more than 1.3% to get back to break even. I think on a 1% loss, it's like 1.01% or something you have to make back. But on a 6.6% 6 .6 loss, I did the math before the show, but I forgot what I, what I did with it. Um, I think you have to make like 7% in change. And then again, it grows geometrically from there. So one big loss can make a big deal. Now, I ran out of time, but I wanted to give you a really good example where you were maybe trading a somewhat less volatile stock, okay? And you had more, sh and you had more shares on, and you had a big dollar amount of shares on. Maybe this NTLA. Let's let's see what this would be. So if you had 666 shares and at $25 a share, yeah, so that's a 16% or 17% round number. So if you let a stock like this go to zero, your entire portfolio would be down around 17%. And that's a hard loss to take, okay? And that's hard to recover from. So even though the idea is to limit losses and have unlimited gains, you still have to work hard on that and just honor your stops. Now, again, as I said earlier, I think we're just scratching the surface from a psychological perspective when it comes to trend trading. And Maslow's hierarchy of needs comes to mind. So again, from a psychological perspective, I think we're just scratching the surface. There's a need to be right. I would much rather be 
I would much rather be less right and make more money than to be more right and make less money. Like that little streak I just showed you earlier. There's that word streak again. <laughs> It was it was pretty amazing as far as percent correct. And you know, I like to pat myself in the back and hey, look at me, I'm all great. But I would much rather have had one of those stocks go up a few hundred percent. Well, part of the problem was that most of those were actually shorts. And that was uh back in 2016 when the market was rolling over a little bit. And the gains were somewhat limited. Your gains are obviously limited on the short side unless you're reshorting, but that's a, another conversation altogether. But the market did turn around. That's why initial that initial follow-through didn't follow through more than that, and that's why you had so many winners, but not a whole lot of big winners. But we have a need to be right, and it's hard to be wrong, okay? You marry guys, you know you have to learn how to be wrong. You'll find out if not. <laughs> We also have a need for action, okay? I see Craig is chiming in with something here. Craig trains dogs. Well, if Craig sleeps in, goes have him a little latte, maybe a late lunch or something, a little brunch, lunch, whatever, and hangs around all day and doesn't go train dogs, what's going to happen? Well... He's not going to have any money. He's going to have to do something at some point in time. I know we have some doctors in here. You have to go out and see some patients. You have to take some sort of action. The more motivated you are, the harder trading can be because you have a need to take action. Now, this brings us back to those two forms of patience. The patience to wait for the next good setup and the patience to wait once you're in that setup. And then the patience to grind it out, sometimes for months on end, until you get to the big prize, until you get to that big, nice winning streak. There is a need for certainty. One of the most common emails I get, hey, Dave, what can I expect to make? I have no idea. And if someone tells you that they do, then they're lying or they're delusional, okay? I'll give them a pass. Maybe they're just crazy. Because if we get a period like 1999, I had no idea you could make a 1,000% or more, <laughs> you know? But if the market grinds sideways over the next six months, unless we catch a few outliers, which occasionally we can do, but... It's not easy. It's a lot of work. Then we're probably going to barely keep our head above the water. So there's no one who could tell you, excuse me, there's no one who could tell you what to expect, okay? There's no certainty in this. It's funny, Craig saying push your button, get a peanut. That's what I always, uh, that's, I'm always saying that. But, yeah, there's no push a button, get a peanut when it comes to what will happen. I read somewhere, and I forget who said it, but they said, if you're choosing a money manager, focus mostly on the character of the money manager, and I guess their philosophy would be, would be somewhat important, too, versus the returns. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. And in fact, if something was working incredibly well, it's probably due to stop working for a while. So you have to be careful with that. And, and that's where, that's how Bernie Madoff finally got caught. Somebody who understood how markets work, really work was looking at this consistent, 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 never a losing month, always this consistent 1% return or whatever it was he was doing. 
they finally smelled a rat and figured out that, wait a minute, nothing is that, is that good, is that certain. So we do have this need for certainty, but there's nothing you could do about that. And I give Montier a lot of credit because he wrote one of those little behavioral, I think it's actually called a little behavioral finance book or something, but I've read quite a few of these behavioral finance books and, and my problem is after a while they all start to sound the same. Now I'm sure the 10th one I read was probably just as good or maybe even better than the rest or better incrementally, but they all kind of sound the same. They all kind of use a lot of the same examples. I don't know why that is, but I guess there's only so many different ways to talk about it. So I give him a lot of credit. Anyway, long story endless, I know too late. He talked about stress coming up when information is uncertain. Well, there's a big uncertainty when it comes to trading trends. When's that next trend going to come along? When is this losing trade in the portfolio going to turn around, or is it going to turn around? Okay. And the more uncertain you are about something, the more stress you will have. Now, the push a button, get a peanut thing, you feel like, oh, this is great. I just, okay, so I just, I just sell the option, and then I collect my money. And I think a few weeks back, I actually found something by accident on the Internet. I was looking up, trying to figure out a, a, a credit spread or something. Not that I wanted to do it. I was just using an example of something that could could work until it don't. And they made it sound like the moment you sell the option, you keep the profit, and that it's all yours. And in my best, what's his name, Nicholas Fine? I used to have Nicholas somewhere on his computer. Oh, it's actually an old computer. But, you know, no, no, it doesn't work that way, okay? But if you did trade that, it sure would seem for maybe three months, maybe four months, maybe six months, maybe a year. In fact, I've seen some things, and this is one of those two-drink minimum stories. Maybe this is a four-drink minimum. But I've seen some things that I was up close and personal with work for a very long time. Maybe that's why it seems like I have a bit of an axe to grind. Well, I have multiple axes to grind when it comes to that type of trading. Now, we have this need to avoid pain, okay? Well, this doesn't have to be relative to my methodology. It seems like I'm kind of picking apart my methodology here a little bit. But a lot of these things apply to any methodology. There's going to be some pain, okay? Now, not to pick up the reversion mean guys too much, but the pain there is going to be you're going to get absolutely creamed every now and then. Okay, but the rest of the time you'll do quite well. <laughs> but if you're trying to grind it out as a trend follower, whether you're trend following like me or some other type of trend following, you're going to have some losses along the way. In fact, we get paid to put capital into harm's way. And that's the only way you ever make any money is if you're willing to risk some money. Okay. But we have a need to avoid pain. Now, I could probably put a hundred of, of these things in here if I sat around and thought about them for a little while. I just want to kind of throw a few things at you today. But we also have this need for this positive feedback loop, okay? And I guess that kind of goes along the, the lines of the need to be right. But where, where I was going with this is more like a, wait a minute. I made a trade, I lost. I made a trade, I lost. I made a trade, I lost. Well, you know, how does this work? Is it like beating your head against the wall? It feels so good when I stop? Okay. Why would I keep doing the same thing over and over and expect a different outcome? I Somebody asked me uh, this morning, do I trade anything other other than what I show in these webinars and on my stock service? And I do a little bit, but I keep the trend following in mind, and it's within the core methodology for the most part, meaning that I might trade a more volatile stock or a stock that I know 
could be really dangerous to trade, maybe a little thinner, maybe a little cheaper, and again, volatile. And I know that if I put it in a service, it's either going to win big or you're going to get creamed in the stock. And I feel like, well, it, it's a little too dangerous to put in a service. And, and that doesn't happen that often, but every now and then there's something like, eh, it's a little bit crazy and it's not worth it. But for the most part, again, I follow everything. Now, where I'm going with this is somebody asked me, again, do I do things outside? And, and as I've said before, I like to trade a little Forex. It's not my bread and butter. It's something I kind of do for little S&Gs, for S&Gs, I should say. And I like to trade like hourly bow ties off of longer term daily charts. Now, I'm not day trading, although some of the positions don't last very long. I hope to be with them for a long, long time. And if you go in and look at the dollar yen, that's one of those positions that was put on an hourly basis. But if you go in and watch the week of charts, probably from October, when I think I put the position on way back then, I went in and I had a losing trade. I went again and again, had a losing trade. I went in again and losing trade. And it wasn't until the third or the fourth time that I caught this huge trend in the dollar yen. And I remember on that third trade or that fourth trade, I began to question my own sanity on that. But I knew that if I kept plugging away at it, I would eventually catch a really nice trend. Now, you can't get egotistical and just do crazy stuff. But getting back to like the core methodology, if you're chipping away at it and you're like, hey, I got a really great setup, I'm going to take it. Got stopped out, no problem. Market's still trending, sector's sector still, yeah, market's still trending, sector's still trending. The stocks within the sector are still trending. I think I'm going to take this next setup. And you keep doing that, especially if the market's trending. If the market's going sideways, chopping around, obviously a little bit different story, but you still have to chip away at it. And be prepared to go through that drawdown. And as I often say, or used to say at least, you get that African queen syndrome where you just give up. And then if you had just gone that little bit further, you would have hit the big prize. You would have hit that big string of winners or at least that big outliner maybe that would have made your year. And the reason I say African queen syndrome was they were in the African queen. And it's a good movie. You might want to watch it if you haven't watched it before. I actually went down and visited the, the boat so I can get a picture of it from a column. And I go to no extent and expense for you guys. Well, a lot of extent and a lot of expense. Anyway, long story endless, too late, I know. They almost made it to the lake, okay? And then the camera pans back. They'd given up, defeated, deflated. And they were like within yards. What's the... Um, Anybody, I haven't read the book, or but I've heard the story before. 100 feet from gold or 10 feet from gold, or I forget the exact, the exact book or story or whatever. But there was someone who thought they there was a potential for this gold vein, and they bought all this equipment, and they dug and dug and dug and dug and dug and dug and dug, and dug on their lease or whatever you call it, wherever you dig gold, and they gave up. So they sold all the equipment for pennies on the on the dollar, and then the new people came in, and, and I don't know if it took them a day or so, but 10 feet. They were 10 feet away from the largest gold find, I guess, at least at the time, a big vein of gold. Now, again, this kind of brings us back to talking, talking out of both sides of my mouth with the definition of insanity. Like, how long are you going to keep doing that? Well, if you wrap your head around the methodology – it could take possibly a year to catch a really large move and catch a really good streak, and as I word again, streak, uh, or at least a few big outliers. It could take quite a while. So you really have to chip away at it for a long time, and you have to be long game oriented. All right. All right, let's see. We've got some questions coming in. Let me get these questions before I change subjects. Okay, Rick says, that portfolio looked great considering the Dow Jones Industrial Average from November 2015 to May was a W formation. You shorted the way down with the market, then you bought it away up. Perfect trend following. Yeah, you know, and you, you can't get too caught up in the big picture things. Um, 
I really thought the market was rolling over. Was it last summer or summer before? I actually got slightly bearish, but I knew that I could be right but early. And I'm willing to pick myself up, dust myself off, and start all over again. When we went into those those heavy shorts back in late 2015, now that's what it was, late, uh, late summer 2015 to the fall, I really thought the market was rolled over. And then we put on a, a, quite a few shorts. And like I told everybody, it's like, hey, you know, worst case scenario, we get stopped out of them all, and the market goes straight up, and we start buying stocks again. And that's what we did. Fortunately, we caught a little bit of a move down, which was nice. Craig says, the big problem is pushing a button, get a peanut, because those short, the short-term reinforces are almost impossible to minimize. It's hardwire as hunter-gatherers. Yeah, and then that's something that I really wanted to, uh, or at least I thought I would get into today quite a bit, the psychology of that, that need to be right. And that's that, that Maslow's, you have some of those things that are a little, little further down that ladder, at the beginning of the ladder, where you want that, that constant positive reinforcement. And the society we live in has, has created that. I mean, if you text somebody, it's like you want to hear back from them right away. And I, and I, I try to avoid looking at a text or, or, or it, it, God forbid, doing a text while I'm driving, you know, and I, and I know if it's, if it's the wife, she probably wants to hear back from me. And it's like, because we put ourselves under all this pressure and everything is moving so fast, uh, microwave popcorn, you know, uh, as I often say, nobody, what's the last time you've seen a movie store? There's, there's used to be one in town closed down late last year or within about a year ago. And I'm like, they must be selling crack or something. Like, what is that some sort of uh is that some sort of front for something? You know, how are they stay in business? Because who who goes buy a movie anymore? You just download them or whatever. You buy them online. I mean, you might you might you might stop by a red box every now and then if something catches your eye, but for the most part, you're not gonna go out and get a movie, you know? Uh it's just the society we live in has made it worse. What need does that meet, the outside of the service? Well, okay, now you, you keep keep in mind, like if I'm taking a trade outside of the service, like a while back I mentioned one, I forget which one it was, Quick, I think, or something, which was a thinner, volatile stock that, that set up as a beautiful pullback, but it was a little too risky to put in a service. And then somebody asked about the um, that stock in a webinar, and one of my clients was like, why didn't you show us? I was like, well, I think it might have been on the Landry list, but I couldn't make it an official recommendation just because it just was a little bit too thin, a little too volatile, whatever the case was. I'm not trading that stock to solve my need for action. I'm trading that stock because I like the setup and I've seen the pattern a thousand times and I think that it has potential, but I also think it has tremendous risk and it's probably not worth risking that when you're trying to have a fairly controlled and hopefully consistent, as I word hope, portfolio. Now, I'm not day trading the Forex. I'm making little quotes in the air like you can see me. I'm not day trading the Forex. I am position trading, and I don't even remember when the positions that I have on were put on. I think they were put on back in October because I know I had on had some when I, I spoke in October and then I spoke back in November. Both happened to be in Vegas, and I remember both times I had positions on and I don't think I put on a new position since. So it's not like I'm trying to to get that need for action. I keep myself stupid busy. I'm in here probably 12 hours a day and then maybe an extra hour or so at night on occasion on my laptop or whatever. And, and I mean, I don't know how long I can keep it up, but, uh, you know, I've been grinding it out for a long time. But I keep myself that busy so I'm not making those trades. It's, it's, I've reached the point where the trades actually are taken away from, from my projects and stuff. I have to take time out of the projects to put the trades on to manage the trades. Now, that's actually a good thing because I'm not spending time staring at a screen all day long. Now, I still do that a little bit and a little bit more than I should, but for the most part, I keep myself so busy I don't have time to sit there and watch the screen, nor 
what I want to. So again, I'm not doing the Forex for action, even though the positions are based on an hourly chart. The reason they're based on an hourly chart is because Forex is much more efficient. And I think that you have to, to drill down to a lower time frame within a bigger time frame to capture some sort of inefficient move in an efficient market. Um, I don't want to get too sidetracked on that because I'm going a little long today. Imagine that. But go in and uh, look at my special reports in my store. I make you walk through the gift shop before you uh, get to the free stuff. But I talked about inefficiency in one of those special reports on that, okay? Leon says, once you accept that it's impossible to predict the market direction, then it all begins to make sense. Amen. Amen, brother Leon. I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah, and it's hard, man. You got it's hard to check your ego at the door. I mean, that was my big problem early on when I first started putting out public commentary. I started chasing my own tail because I wanted to look smart and I wanted to look right and I wanted to predict the market every day. And and then finally I realized that I was chasing my own tail. I was gonna kill myself trying to do that. So you just have to let it go. And I think I picked this up from Greg Morris, but you know, sometimes, and this is this is where I keep coming back to that that beginner course, is that sometimes it's not these big revelations, like some sort of uh, new setup or indicator or pattern or something that like is is an epiphany. Sometimes it's it's common sense, and that's why I'm so excited about this course because there's so many things that I think the course solves for. And then one of the things I picked up, like I said, from Greg Morris was that in order to, to follow a trend, you must first have a trend to follow. And I knew that, but just hearing it from someone who's been around a lot longer than me and who has accomplished, accomplished an incredible great deal in their life, it makes a lot of sense. So, yeah, once you start having these little simple epiphanies like you don't know what's going to happen next. I mean, that's something obviously I put in the course too. Like no one knows the secret to the markets is no one knows exactly what a market will do. You know, not you, not me, and not the guy who screams on TV. Still means you need something you or service doesn't offer as greater risk reward. I'm not sure what you're saying on that. I'm just saying that I, I kind of treat the this, this service somewhat like a money manager would with his portfolio that's under money management. And the, the, the trades that are outside of the service are still within the methodology, okay? But they might be a little bit more riskier or, 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 or could create an extreme amount of volatility in the portfolio. But trust me, if you look at the open portfolio right now, there's plenty of volatility in there, okay? And I do push the envelope when it comes to volatility, okay? <laughs> Had a money manager looking at me once and he's like, um, I said something about, you know, would you ever put in, put on something uh, pre-market or after market? He goes, not in your stocks, you know, because he's, he saw the volatility involved with them. So yeah, but again, that's that's in one of those free reports too. That's better the devil you know. I, I do believe in the more volatile stocks, and I'm talking about something very extreme. So yeah, I'm not I'm not making any outside trades for action or because I'm doing something that I don't preach publicly. I, it just might be something again, not to beat the dead horse, a little more volatile, or I'm trading in a more inefficient market like forex. Short-term reinforces are almost impossible to minimize as hard-wired in us as hunters-gatherers. Well, that's interesting because, yeah, Craig actually brought it back to, I was talking about what Craig said in more modern times about push a button, get a peanut, and he actually backs it all the way back up to caveman times. And that's one of the reoccurring three themes that I occasionally talk about when we get to talking about the amygdala and the physiological 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 problems with trading that flight of fight 
thing, which is great for caveman times, but not so much in modern day times. But yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's funny you brought it back to that. I was talking to more modern day times, but it goes back all the way to hunters and gatherers. Okay. You have to walk past your favorite fishing hole to fish a hole you never fished before, but you know has a big lunker. It's the same thing we tell our kids about delayed gratification for the future. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of delayed gratification in trade. Um, one of the reoccurring theme lately, because I've been working on this course for last nearly, I think it's been nearly two years, is can you be successful with just the basics? And then somebody's helping me beta test the, uh, the course that I'm working on. And he was kind of referring to the fact that a lot of things in the course I have covered uh, before, certainly touched upon before in the Week of Charts archives. And he said, the trade of psychology you go through and the money management you tie in is gold, something I definitely think people aren't spending much time taking to understand. And that's one of the things that I, I talked about early in the course, how the three are intertwined. And you've seen me probably do the, the three-corded speech or the three-stranded rope with the money management, the psychology, and the methodology. And if you get better at one, you get better at all. And as I often say, and that's it, that's also in the in the course, and a lot of the first, I think this is in the first four videos, which I'm going to roll out for free really soon, is how they are intertwined. And if you get better at one, you get better at all. And then the bottom line, the whole point of all this is that you have to see trading or approach trading, I should say, holistically. Your videos are awesome, though, and I think anyone could benefit from the intro course you put together if they actually followed it. And that's the one thing that I'm thinking about is that, you know, my wife was saying, like, none of your existing clients don't want an intro course. And I'm like, yeah, but you got to understand there's so many problems that I see that are being made, like trying to make something happen in less than ideal conditions, maybe not honoring a stop, not taking a trade that they should take. And the list goes on and on and on. And if you just followed the basics, 95 to 99% of all these things can be eliminated. And then he went on to say, I personally have an issue. And this is one thing that I'm seeing over and over again. And this is what we talked about quite a bit last week. Um, a gentleman by the name of Rick was saying that he saw the light not when he not when Big Dave gave him some little pattern that was fantastic that he just printed money with, but when I said you got to get your money management down, you've got to be selective, you have to trade when there's a trend, you have to plan your trade, trade to plan, all these very basic things. But again, I think 90 to 99 percent, maybe even more than 99 percent of the problems can be fixed with just the basics. So he says he personally has an issue pulling a trigger on his stocks and he knows the system and he thinks he's picking pretty good stocks or perhaps I'm looking for too much perfection when it comes to trading. So he's having a little bit of, he's a little hesitant to make the trade. Well, my answer to that was drop your size down to only, to an almost meaningless amount and get the reps in. And that's something that I talked about further into the course when I got heavy to the psychology is that you have to get your reps in and then you have to be willing to pull that trigger and then once you do you have to be willing to see it to fruition and the way you do that is to just do it and get the reps in now it's much harder why why can't he pull the trigger well he can't pull the trigger because he knows if he pulls the trigger he could be wrong okay and that goes for you and me and the guy that screams on TV yada 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 but he knows he could be wrong. So the fact that he could be wrong is what's causing him to freeze. But what if he was trading at a size that was so small that if he were wrong, it would monetize into, let's say, a nice meal or a round of golf or what you would spend on a tank of gas for your boat or something, then all of a sudden it's not that big of a deal, okay? So 
you do it by doing it. And if you're having trouble doing it, then reduce your size to where that loss doesn't really bother you. And then it becomes second nature. I know it sounds kind of weird. I really have don't have a better way of explaining it, but I read some of these books about successful people and they kind of talk about the same thing. So maybe maybe I'm not crazy, but sometimes sometimes I make a trade, like yesterday, I had to scale out of some positions and I was tempted to just say, I'm just gonna hold on, hold on, hold on, to see if I could squeeze out, squeeze out. And they were going against me a little bit, but they were still profitable. But I knew I had to take the partial profits and follow the system. Otherwise, I'd be a hypocrite, of course. But it's like it's almost like an out of, out of body experience. And I went and sold those things down because I had to take those profits. Okay, and the same thing happens in taking a loss. I don't want to make it sound like I'm just taking profits. If I had to take a loss, take a loss. Not that I'm perfect. Far from it. Okay. But it's like I find myself doing these things almost in kind of an out-of-body way to a point where I, I've become detached to where I'm actually – when I actually look at, at what I have in my telechart as my portfolio, I'm like, am I still long that? Am I still short that? It's, I have to think twice. Did I scale out of that or not? I actually kind of have to think about it a little bit because I find my execution can be somewhat automatic, if that makes any sense. And I'm somewhat detached. And I can hardly ever remember a stock once once I stop out of it. It, it, it takes a while to get to that point. And that's something I didn't want to I didn't want to kind of I didn't want to get into today, but I was thinking about it before the show. Is that a few months back I talked about how uh, Curtis Faith seemed to be a little flippant in his trading early with the turtles or whatever. And you really do have to be flippant and just not care. It just you go in, you make the trade, and when you're done, you're done. For instance, you know, I just said I was short the yen. Um, a few months from now, I probably won't remember that trade. Okay. In fact, I'll be quite frank with you. I was long to actually one still open. I can't I can't think of what it is. I mean I could switch screens and find out, but there I'm long something right now at a stop. In Forex, I can't remember what it is. And then I think I just stopped out at a Euro NZD. I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure that stopped out earlier this week. And I forget about it that quick. I used to never be like that, okay? I used to pull it up, whatever it is, a stock or whatever, every 10 minutes after I got out. But you have to reach a point where you don't, you know, pardon my French, where you just don't give a shit, okay? And then that's when all of a sudden things start to work. You're like, oh, wow. You know, look at my account. It, it, it's actually going high. And it's, wow, I, I didn't realize I was doing that well. Okay. Now, that doesn't always happen. I just spent 30 minutes telling you how you might have to grind it out, and it might take months and months and months and months. But longer term, if you can reach a point where you're a little bit more flippant and just follow along and do what has to be do, to done, <laughs> then uh, what's got to be did, I would say, <laughs> I interviewed a guy once years years and years ago. I was at a in a lower management position and we, we needed somebody to, to work in IT and especially on the weekends. And I forgot to ask him if he's he'd be willing to work on a Saturday and, and so my boss, I asked my boss, oh, I forgot to ask him and uh boss says, Yeah, I asked him. I was like, well, what did he say? He says, Worst got to be did, it's got to be did. So uh needless to say, we didn't hire this gentleman, but uh you know, sometimes in trading, things have got to be did, okay? Well, Chief Orman, you really wound up. Many of the psychological aspects of trading must be personally experienced. Otherwise, they don't make any sense, and you won't understand them. Yeah, Leon, that's the, that's the chicken and the egg thing that I talk about. And I almost took that out of the course because I, I found myself kind of caught up in, in explaining it. But, yes. Until you actually trade a methodology, you won't know the psychology that will be involved and whether or not you could actually trade the methodology. And that's the big, and that's probably why I feel like I'm on this uh, crusade when it comes to preaching against reversion to the mean or any other open-ended type of trading where you, where you could have open-ended losses. 
is because psychologically that is very, very difficult and destabilizing. It's one thing to have a little 2% loss, 2% loss, 2% loss, and you kind of get bummed out or down in the dumps. It's another thing to, to have a, a whacking overnight to where you get hit so hard you feel like you've just been wiped out. Those are two different things from a psychological standpoint, okay? And, and that whacking overnight can be especially tough if that trading you were doing, that reversion to the mean type of trading, worked for two years or three years or four years, and you were feeling pretty good about it. And you told your boss to F off <laughs> because you were consistently making that 2% every month, okay? Craig says, that's it, Dave. Money management stop, size stops entries, tools used to fight our hardware, our weaknesses. Yeah, you know, and there's a lot of things, as I often say, money management will cure a multitude of sins. And then that's one thing that I got into when I got further into the course. It looks like I'm going to give you the whole course here. <laughs> one week at a time. I better get it out soon. But that's one thing. That there's hacks, okay? You know, the trading, the hacks are the big thing right now. You see that all over the Internet, how you can you know, make this little hack or this thing can hack that or whatever. But that's one thing I got into when it comes to psychology, the hacks, okay? Well, you're watching the screen too much. Well, put a stop in. You're not owning your stops. Well, put a stop in, okay? And go about your business. You could maybe even use a stop entry order if it's a little bit more liquid stock and go about your business, okay? So you don't have to sit there and watch a screen. There's a lot of little hacks you could do to solve some of these psychological problems. Great explanation. <laughs> Great explanation. My problems exactly. Okay. Yeah, well, you know, come on. We all we all get bummed out. We all get stressed out. We all want to micromanage. Okay? Well the solution is don't do that. But I know it's tough. Now as I said recently, uh, kind of touching upon going back to the basics, is trading is not easy, but it's not nearly as difficult as most try to make it. And this is what I've been saying lately. Uh, can you be successful with just the basics? I think you can. And at the very, and then you could take that and then build upon it, okay? Maybe get a little bit better in your stock selection as time goes on. Maybe get a little better in your discipline to follow your discretion when the time comes to control a loss on a trade. Okay, or maybe take those partial profits just when they're slightly below that initial profit target. Okay, all these things we talk about quite often in the show. And then my point last few week was, weeks was you could do much better than the gurus and egotistical money managers. I've seen gurus that have been wrong. There's a guru out there right now. It makes my blood boil. And he's calling for, I think he's calling for a massive crash, okay? Well, he called for a massive up move in the markets in uh, 2000, probably March of 2000, right? <laughs> you know, this idiot comes out every 10 years and sells a bunch of books. And, and uh, my brother-in-law actually sent me one of the books once, and I'm like, oh, this is such BS, you know? Anyway, I think he was calling for Dow 80,000 back then, and that was in 2000. We all know what happened then. And I think he's calling for a massive crash now. I'm not going to throw him under the bus and say who it is, but you people here are smart enough to know that you can't make that big picture of prediction. Okay, I'm lucky if I can predict a few days out when it comes to the markets. So the point is that, yeah, I think you could be successful with the basics. At least it gives you something to build upon. And at the least, you're not going to lose $4 billion because you're obstinate, okay, and you're not going to be like these gurus who, who predict early and often, right? It's always the top. And a few things along those lines. You know, just follow some of these basics, and then you'll stay out of a lot of trouble. Don't be a hero. Don't have an ego. All right, I keep threatening, but I think I'm closer now than I've ever been. So I've got a little question mark on the countdown to launch. But I think... I think you're going to see a countdown on my website starting next, sometime next week. Maybe I get it out before Easter. And I'm pretty excited about it, as you can tell.
And the actual course is going to be part of the learning management system rollout, but I will have, um, like I said, at least the first four videos or so for free, and those will be uh, coming out hopefully maybe within two weeks, and that's the beginner's course I'm talking about. Um, you know, I keep talking about the delayed service. Get them delayed service at the least so you can follow along so it doesn't look like what I'm saying is in perfect hindsight. Uh, I need to update this. I haven't updated it in a while, and that's because we had a position that – or a setup that went like two or three weeks without triggering, and it was kind of bending the rules a little bit because it was an IPO. And uh, so those might be a little bit behind if you're looking at the delayed, but I promise just everything going on right now, I just haven't been uh, keeping up with some of these things like the delayed service. But I will get I will get back on that, promise. So follow, so go ahead and sign up. At least you can look at the archives, and I'll get those uh, I'll get those new ones on uh, first chance. Maybe tonight I'll put them in. Got any questions? Shoot me an email. Anything that requires a lot of thought, we can cover here. So feel free to shoot me an email. And then obviously a lot of stuff. All right, let's get to the live charts. Uh, you guys want to start in girls? Want to start asking about? Uh, yeah, Susan, you got his name right. I'm not going to I'm not going to throw him under the bus, but it really it it really pisses me off uh that this guy comes out every 10 years, writes a book, <laughs> goes on book tours and it's like, you know, such bullshit. Oh, Chief Orman, you really wound up today. Yeah, Joe, you got it too. <laughs> Yep. What an idiot. But, you know, to each his own, you know. Maybe he thinks I'm a trend-following moron. I hope he does. be fun to get a little Twitter fight with him. That's just not my style, you know. Goes around, comes around, right? All right, let's talk about the market a little bit, and then we'll start looking at your uh, your stocks. Can you guys see the ants? Can you guys see each other's answers, questions? <laughs> Um, peas. Well, I'm glad to see a little bit of a pop today. I wouldn't get too excited. We've got uh, Phil's famous 50-day moving average in here. We did come down and tag it ooh, about two weeks ago, and so far it's held. Nothing magical about it, but as I often preach, daylight, meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average, okay, um, can be very helpful when it comes to staying on the right side of the trend. So you can see going all the way back to November, except for one day, the lows stayed above the moving average. And if you go back in time and look at like a weekly chart, because it gives you a little bit better perspective, it filters out some of the noise, you could see that just sticking with the slope, meaning that if the moving average is going up, you want to be long, and just sticking with the daylight, meaning that if the lows are above the moving average, you want to be long. If the slope is down, you want to be short. If the lows or, I'm sorry, the highs are less than the moving average, meaning daylight downside, you want to be short, okay? And then the same thing goes for the upside, downside, upside, okay? So daylight, this is something I covered in the fourth video, which is free, by the way, which I'll be sitting out, hopefully starting within the next two weeks, but simply following something like daylight and a longer term moving average like this on a weekly chart can help to keep you on the right side of the market. And this also works on the daily charts in shorter term. So taking a look at the P's again, we had nice daylight since November, so far so good. In more recent times, we've gone a little sideways, but it's not the end of the world. We're not too far away from all-time highs. So when the market is at or near all-time highs, what do you want to do? You want to err on the side of longer-term trend. You don't want to write a book about the world ending soon, okay? I guess I could make more money if I, <laughs> publicly, if I wrote books about the world going to end. And then maybe once, maybe once, you know, like one gentleman, I'm not going to say his name, who, who got the top right, 40 years ago, and it still, have, still has a career off of that, which is shocking. Anyway, take a look at NASDAQ. NASDAQ, bit of a bummer yesterday, uh, outside day down, but it's just off of all-time highs. What's that, about a percent away? Oh, half percent away, round numbers. 
So far, so good there. Do, what do we have here? We have some, what? Daylight. There you go. Good job. And we have, what? A positive slope in the 50-day moving average. Nothing magical about the 50, although Phil might disagree with me, but nothing magical about it, but it can be a wonderful tool to help keep you on the right side of the market, to help pay attention to what's going on, just like the bow ties can do the same thing. Take a look at the Russell. Russell scores a bit of a bummer yesterday because it sold off percent and change down towards the bottom of its range. Now, what was I just saying about the 50? Now, here's the thing. Before I digress too far talking about indicators, keep in mind as I preach that indicators are really more illustrators than they are indicators. They don't indicate anything, okay? They don't tell you what's going to happen tomorrow and in the future, but they do tell you what has happened and what has been happening, happening okay? So what's the 50 saying? The 50 saying that the market is going sideways. Well, it doesn't take a rocket surgeon to look at this market and say, wait a minute. Yeah, it's right around where we were way back when, way back in November. Bam, flat, okay? And it depends on which day you pick. It might even be down slightly, okay? There you go. Okay, down a half percent since December, okay? So that is a sideways market. Now, I'm not going to rush out and short it, but I wouldn't get too excited about rushing out and buying it just yet, although it's kind of hanging in there. Now, let's just go through a few of these sectors. A lot of these sectors are getting a little mixed in here. Energies are kind of mixed. You can see they're kind of crawling back towards their old highs. I wouldn't get too excited to energies until they started making some marginal new highs. Same thing for metals and mining, okay? And then if you look at net, net a little longer here, you can see that you can go all the way back to when? Back to December 16 for like a year. We've been pretty sideways, okay? Well, not, that's not quite a year, I'm sorry. Last year is what I meant to say, since last year. Now, some areas like the banks are beginning to look a little dubious, okay? And this is why we've been looking to short the banks lately. You could pretty much throw a dart at the banks, although there's a few caveats I would suggest if you do want to short them. Short the thicker ones. Short the ones that don't have a lot of uh, nearby support if you're going to short them. But the banks, again, look a little dubious. You've got a daily bow tie here and probably somewhat longer bow tie form. I mean, this is almost a two-day bow tie beginning to form. So I'm not very excited about the banks. I'm not very excited about the financials, okay? Financials have a bow tie down. And if the financials take out the bottom of this range here, I would be concerned. We've got a lot of support down here, but that's a pretty far ways down based on the volatility of it. And percentage-wise, for an overall market, that's probably a pretty big move. Yeah, that's a 20% move lower. If the financials lose 20% of their value, it'd probably be fairly ugly. Now, the other thing that I'm seeing is some of these sectors, like, take a look at, like, the um, hardware and software. Like the overall market, you could see that they've lost some steam as of late. Semiconductors, which have been doing really great, kind of sideways as of late, too. So the bottom line is the market is losing steam. I'm cautiously optimistic, and I know it's kind of a couch and a stupid thing to say, but I am cautiously optimistic. As long as that NASDAQ can hang around new highs, as long as the S&P can hang around new highs, as long as that Russell isn't too far away from all-time highs, even though it's kind of sideways and look a little dubious, I'm going to continue to err on the side of longer-term trend. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm not going to short individual sectors if I see an opportunity. I'm just not going to go crazy and short with both fists. For instance, the banks right now, I think, could be a good short. Financials, brokerages, all of these areas, again, looking kind of dubious. There's that word again. So I would consider a possible short there, but I'm not going to get heavily short and go crazy on the short side. And I'm not going to write a book about the end of the world as it relates to the markets. Now, on the long side, I'm going to probably be more and more and more selective. Um, in doing my analysis last night, I only found one stock that I thought had potential. And then that one might even come off today. Okay, maybe maybe there's two or three, but they weren't that many. And I might end up sitting on my hands a little bit. Well, the methodology requires a pullback, and the pullback should only be so many days. When the market goes sideways for months like it has, or weeks at least, in case of some of the indices, 
then there's nothing to do. And that's okay. If you wrote a book about the end of the world, it might prove more interesting. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I know, you know, I, I'm try, I try to make it, you know, I, th I throw in a little joke every now and then, but yeah, trading done properly is really pretty, uh, pretty boring. And that's, and that's one of the epiphanies that, uh, one of my clients who has struggled the most out of, uh, out of or at least more than most, um, he really started to get it is when he found out that, or he discovered that it was, it's kind of boring, you know? Dave, that helps tremendously. Small, almost meaningless, or detached enough is almost meaningless. Almost meaningless. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you have to reach a point where it's meaningless and you just start forgetting about your trades and all. All right, I know I've pontificated enough. Let's uh, let's take a look at some of these stocks in here. All right, somebody wants to know about USB. Well, USB is a bank, okay? But it looks like it's already kind of broken down a little bit. Um, you know, without giving you my whole Landry list, take a look at some of these big banks in here. Uh, CMA comes to mind. There's a half a dozen more of them, or a dozen more of them, where it's just making these bow ties. Okay, if they begin to crack, they've got a long ways to go. Now, here's the good news: on the short side, usually, I don't like to wait too long before a position triggers. So, I would say if these things don't trigger over the next few days, we may have dodged a bullet when it comes to these uh, stocks. Okay, don't predict but follow. Amen. Jill, Rick says Jill. Are you referring to Jill or Jill? Oh, uh, yeah, okay, Jill the stock. Yeah, this looks kind of interesting. Um, if you were trading the little, uh, let's see, it's kind of interesting. It's above the 50-day moving average. Oh, let's add the average in there. Let's see if we can add it. Oh, okay, yeah, that's a, just for S&Gs, let's put the, um, Let's add in a five-day moving average and see what happens. Okay. So if you were trading the, the little five-day thing, I mean, in perfect hindsight, obviously, but your entry would have been on this day here because you have a new closing high and the low is greater than the moving average, maybe even this day. Yeah, that day right here. So this would be your entry there. Um, I'm a little bit more lenient with IPOs when it comes to pullbacks and such, but I think what I would do in this particular case, I would let it pull back a little bit or wait for the pullback before looking to go after it. The other thing, too, with IPOs is, you know, what's the story of Fat or Glory? It's a retail store. Maybe there's some excitement. I don't know what kind of clothes Joe makes. Uh, maybe there's some fad there or something that could be played, you know, like a Lululemon or whatever. But I would wait for it to pull back a little bit if you if you didn't uh, if you're not already long on that one. B1 too thin. Let's take a look at that. Um, yeah, it's too thin. Probably too thin. I mean, as a private trader, you could probably trade it. I mean, it's 100,000 shares. It's $8 stock. I mean, it's not ridiculously thin, but it's a little thin. Um, you got some issues much, much longer term. I mean, it's okay. Um, it didn't quite pull back enough in here. It's okay. You know, put it on your watch list as a as a one. Chris wants to know about uh, FRSH. Good to see you. Yeah, um, definitely put that in your uh, watch list. My only problem is that, nope, take it out. Because you've got too much overhead supply to deal with, okay? And again, you know, getting back to the basics. Sometimes these little basic things are all you need to know. So, yeah, I wouldn't, I'd leave that one alone. FI for Donald. Uh, no, too much. Again, you've got, it's kind of an electrocardiogram, okay? I mean, I hear what you're saying because if you zoom this in, you probably have a bow tie. Yeah, you got a beautiful bow tie. It's kind of a perfect little setup. you got a gap, two gaps in the direction of the trend. The new trend, I should say. This looks fantastic. But then you got this big gap down. And when when you have a gap down of that size, 
it kind of puts the market into a bit of disequilibrium to where you now have a lot of people that are anxious to get out of the stock, okay? So anyone who's trapped in this range and didn't get out, or anyone who's still still long, is going to look to get out likely during this range. Now, there's no guarantees in the market, but that's what technical analysis is all about, is reading the psychology of the overall market. In my definition, takes it one step further while embracing your own. CPLP? CPLP? Jill says no. Why are you so quick to say no? Maybe he's a nice guy. Uh, no, this is a shipper. I think you could do better in the shippers. Um, kind of sideways, longer term in here. We're long salt in the shippers, okay? And you can see that it's headed high. Oh, look at that. Bam, winning. <laughs> nice little move today. Um, and then salt doesn't have any overhead until about 20. So I think we've got another, a good shot of going up to maybe 20, 30 bucks a share in the stock, hopefully. I just said hope. But when you got a stock that looks like this, put that on your watch list as opposed to something that looks like that, okay? And it's kind of stuck in a range. And again, you know, getting back to the basics, I don't want to beat you up too much because that's what some people say is I beat them up too much in these things. But sometimes just the basics, you know, look at the net net change. You can see it's been somewhat sideways, and that'll keep you out of a lot of trouble. The word no was the question because you'll see other comments. Oh, okay. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Well, I don't want to start matchmaking in here. I get in trouble fast. Susan says SBLK is a shipper. Yeah, in, in this case, you know, and I've been bullish on these shippers, and finally they're beginning to take off again. But, you know, look at something like SBLK as opposed to that other one. And these are what I call Phoenix stocks, okay? And there's, not, there's no pattern in and of itself other than now that you'd be playing pullbacks here, but uh, if you go back to something like uh, salt, I think salt was more of like a, a transitional type of pattern. But now they, there are going to be more pullbacks. But I still, I still think they have tremendous opportunities in these stocks because you take a look at this one here. If this thing returns to its old highs, it's up. I know I sound like the silver guys on TV. If silver just returns to half of its old highs, you'll make 60% on your money. But... I do believe that with these Phoenix stocks, sometimes they can return to the oil glory. And even if they only get halfway back there, you're still doing pretty good. Kind of like salt, you know. Uh, 125, you know, we're down here at 10. So this could maybe turn into a 12 bagger, okay. We'll probably get stopped out long before it does. But if it does turn into a 12 bagger, then um, it's in that little open portfolio, and then I got a good lesson on following the plan. If it stops out of profit, then I still got a good little lesson, okay? So, see, no matter what happens, I still look good. We've got three people who want to talk about UCTT. Uh, one of you guys sent me a thank you note on this one, so I appreciate that. I don't have my email in front of me. Yeah, this looks fantastic. Uh, it could use a little bit more pullback, just a, maybe to like 14 and a half. But it does look good. Somebody sent me an email saying that uh, they followed the basics and they stuck with the position. Stuck with the position. So if you're in here, I forget who that was, but let me know. Fast. That's going to be an ETF. Um, I'm not a big fan of leveraged ETFs. I'm not a huge fan of um, ETFs in general. Um. I mean, I hear you. I mean, I'm bearish on the financials. You've kind of got a bow tie here. But I think the ultimate system for leveraged ETFs, and, and I'm going to give you something here. This is free, okay? Free of charge. You ready? Short the short ETFs. Short the stuffing out of the leveraged short ETFs. Why do you say that, Dave? Well, take a look at this one. 300 to what? I think they'll all go to zero eventually. It's the way the math works because it keep you have to short. You have to keep shorting at lower levels. Is that how it works? But these things all go to zero, okay? And then they have to reverse split them and such. Somebody just throw throw me out one. Somebody throw me out a reverse ETF while I'm pulling up the next stock, and we'll take a look at it and we'll see what it's done. 
rocks. Um, longer term, kind of wide and loose, kind of crazy. HV100. Uh, you know, maybe put on your watch list, but it's barely getting past this high. It had this huge gap in here. It went up how many hundreds of percent? 116 percent over a short period of time. A little crazy. So I think I'd pass on that one. SH is a short ETF. All right, there you go. There's there's your system right there. Okay, look. What do you do? What do you do? What did Big Dave say to do? Short the short ETFs. Okay. Look at that. Looks like looks like I have a shill in here, huh? Show me that one. Ah, show me anyone. I don't care. T VIX? Ah, that's a VIX, but the T VIX will work. Short? They're short. So you get short a T VIX at $175,000. Where is it today? $30. That's quite the short there, huh? Okay, thank you, Phil. UCTT was on the lander list, 12516. Well, I appreciate that, Phil. Thanks for uh, noticing. All right, we have another short ETF. Everybody ready? Short the short ETFs. Well, you would have gotten some. Oh no, it's Doug. Sorry, D U G. All right. Well, you've gotten some trouble here and there, but from 100 down to 40. Okay. Dust is another one. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think I made my point. Short the short ETFs went from 4,000, and now you're down to what? 28. Okay. Jim says, I have been long UCTT since 12716 using my interpretation of your TKO. Oh, you're welcome, Jim. Awesome. SRS for Miss Karen. How you doing, Karen? Good to see you. Sorry I didn't have time to spend in New York. It was a crazy trip for me. Um yeah, it's a short ETF. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I've kind of let's take a look at a weekly on this. Uh let's take a little at monthly. Thank you for that one. Yep, look, short the short ETFs, 10,000, and now it is at uh, 33. Yeah, I think I made the point. All right. Andre says, cool. Andre didn't, didn't get to hang out with you either. I'm sorry about that, guys. It was a crazy trip. And then I had to get up at like 3 a.m. to fly out. Plus, I still had to do my nightly work. Lots of uh, lots of overhead here, which is not that far away. I think I would pass on this one. Um, I mean, I, I hear you. It certainly looks like it could pop up as a swing trade, but just a little too volatile and too much overhead res resistance. DTO, yeah, that'll be the last one. I think we've beat the dead horse on that. Yeah, that's an ETN. Let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at monthly. Well, that one actually did okay. So you might want to let them rally a little first. <laughs> Before you short them. But, yeah, eventually I think they all go to zero. Yeah, so let's do 52-week high. Cool, 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 cool. Yeah, keep that one on your watch list. Uh, you know, even though we're long, I still think it has longer-term uh, potential. Yeah, one thing I find interesting is the utilities are doing fairly well in spite of the potential of um, rising rates. So this one, longer-term, as you can see, it has a bit of a Phoenix characteristic. Yeah, on pullbacks, absolutely. Put that on your watch list for sure. Good eye on that, Andre. AKTS, AKTS. Too thin. Yeah, it's way too thin to trend. Even Crazy Big Dave wouldn't trade that one. But I hear you. Uh, nice thrust higher, nice little pullback. I mean, it looks good, but just way too crazy, uh, Jim. I mean, if you go after it, be really careful. TTPH. Uh, there's not a whole lot of longs I like, in case you guys are wondering. But, yeah, this is on my watch list here. Or my long. Nope, never mind. I'm thinking of something else. It, it's got this big gap down. I just, I'd leave it alone based on that. This, Even though it was a couple years ago, markets could have very long, long bad memories. Hey, Hank. B-I-V-V. -V. Boy, did I go long today? I'm going to wrap things up here. Um, it didn't really get too far past its prior peak in here, but IPOs do sometimes have a breakout characteristic, okay? 
Why would I short a short ETF? Because they all go to zero. And that, that has to do with they have to, they have to, if they short a market and it goes down 10%, then they have to short the market when it's down 10%. They just keep shorting into a down market and the, the math doesn't work. They eventually go through to zero through that and, and um, what do you call that? Tracking errors and everything else? Sky short? Okay, I'm going to have to wrap it up here quickly. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't see this as a short because it's already way down here. Okay, you go back to like those banks, which are way up here as a possible short. They've got a long ways to go. If something's already in a long-term downtrend, I'll leave it alone. Okay, uh, hey, MS did trigger. All right, um, I didn't get any alerts on that. Um, all right, so here's an example. This one just triggered in the, in the, in the service. So here's a stock at high levels. Okay. It begin to crack. It pulls back a little bit. It's also a bow tie. So if you want to short something, and then I have to check. I may be talking my position at this point. But if you want to short something, short something like this that's at higher levels that looks like it has a longer way to go. Okay. Oh, Sky W. Okay. Yeah, uh, some of these airlines look, they're, you know, on a pullback, okay? There was another airline out there. Take a look at the airlines. There's a few airlines that look like they're in trouble. But, yeah, I hear you, Chris. But, yeah, that one's going to have to pull back a little bit. All right, let's do one more, and then we're going to have to, um, let's get to somebody that didn't, uh, we hadn't got to. Uh, um, yeah, we did that one. And then, all right, Jim, let's take a look at CPRX for you. Did we talk about that one? Uh, a little bit on the thin side based on its price. I do hear you, though, and it is kind of interesting. Um, I'd say it looks okay, but it's certainly a very uh, volatile and dangerous kind of stock, but it looks okay because you got a big thrust higher followed by a pullback, borderline kind of crazy, but I hear you, and I think, that's, um, I think it looks pretty good. All right. I've gone way too long today. Um, sorry about went so long in the beginning. Just got all wound up. But anyway, I, I want to thank you guys. I know we have quite a few unanswered questions, but um, we'll get to them uh, hopefully next week or whenever. But you can shoot me an email on these uh, individual stocks. It might take me a while to get back to you, so it might not be that very uh, timely just because there's a lot going on right now. But as usual, I want to thank everybody for coming. I love doing these shows, as you can tell. Uh, any unanswered questions, again, shoot me an email. And uh, if it's an answer that requires a lot of thought, I'll just use it as fodder for next week's uh, show. Uh, if we don't talk to you now and then, everyone have a fantastic weekend. And thank you guys and girls again for coming.